I'm really excited to talk to you today about a uh, topic that uh, is becoming more and more prevalent with the small farm growers that I work with. And, and I want to give a caveat here today. Um, we've probably got some backyard growers online. Uh, this is more kind of focused for growing garlic for market, but in reality, um, you just scale it down for a backyard. So all the things I'm going to talk about, you know, other than some marketing things is going to be, are going to be relevant for the small uh, grower too. Okay. So let's go. We got a lot to go over here, and uh, let's talk about uh, growing garlic. Uh, just some real fast facts here. Uh, you might have heard of Gilroy, California. That's the garlic capital of the world. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read all of these, but one thing I did want you to note is in the third uh, item there, we see that 18% uh, of Americans consume at least one food containing garlic uh, every day. And uh, that actually exceeds what uh, how many French fries are eaten uh, uh, as a percent in the United States. So you can see there's a huge market out there, not only for just the garlic consumed as a food source, but there are medicinal uh, um, uh, marketing opportunities for this crop too. And then likewise, you know, to indicate the demand, the United States is the world's largest importer of garlic. So like I said, there's a lot of opportunity for growers out there. As I indicated earlier, I'm, I'm a small farms educator with the U of I Extension, and I uh, work with uh, small farm growers uh, that are growing uh, garlic for market or are looking at getting into that. I also, I'm a grower myself, and I grow uh, a lot of garlic myself. So I'm going to give you a mix today of, you know, some, uh, some of the extension side of it and some as a practical grower and what have you, and we'll mix that as we, uh, as we go along. So I talk with these growers, why, why are, you know what? What the what is the interest? Why is so much interest in garlic? And and uh, across the board, they'll tell you that the garlic, you know, up there with potatoes and tomatoes, is one of the mainstays of of their small farm operations. And the beauty of garlic is, you know, it's a storage crop. So if you have, for instance, a CSA, a community supported agriculture program, <clears throat> garlic is one that you can market to the people, you know, all through the year, and you take. Um, you're able to keep communication with them and market products to them. Everyone eats garlic, uh, so, you know, if they eat it, we grow it. Uh, um, one of my learned uh, growers that I, I learn a lot from has told me, uh, you grow what you can sell, and garlic is something you can sell. Um, the other things about it is to the scapes. We're going to talk about scapes a little later. There's so much of the product that you can sell you know, throughout the uh, season. So it's, it's a very useful product and it's fun and easy to grow. It's kind of, it's, it's a very interesting one to grow. Okay. <clears throat> so, so just some background so we're all on the same page. <clears throat> Excuse me. Garlic is a, a long season overwintered crop so we're going to plant it uh, in the uh, late fall and harvest it in the uh, dog days of, of summer, July. And um, what happens is basically the, the, the cloves uh, root uh, early in the season. We'll talk about that a little later on and uh, how much growth, growth we want. And then they'll go for, through, through a chill uh, requirement, and then that's when they basically separate into cloves. And then early spring, you know, they separate into cloves, and, and a lot of the growth that we need uh, begins to happen. So that's kind of a, a year in, in the life of garlic. Uh, garlic culture. Um, Garlic is very uh, responsive to the environment in positive and negative ways. And, and for instance, a negative way, um, you won't be very successful growing garlic uh, in areas that are that are high moisture, you know, clay type uh, soils. It just doesn't do well because it is a root crop and you'll have the tendency for rotting. Um, and different cultivars will do well, you know, in, in certain areas and you kind of need to experiment. I'll give you some ideas. Uh, based on trials that the University of Illinois has conducted across the state of some varieties, but you kind of need to play around. The garlic that we grow in this part of the country, in Illinois, is, is hardneck variety. The varieties that you will buy in an average store that you go around uh, Illinois uh, will quite typically be a softneck variety from like California, Florida, or the southeast. Um, we don't grow soft neck variety to speak of uh, in this part of the country because it's not nearly, it isn't as nearly winter hardy as, as the hard neck varieties. Uh, you'll often hear hard neck varieties called top set, uh, and that's what they're, what they mean by that is the stalk stays uh, upright for almost all of the growing season. The soft neck varieties, the stalk falls over. 
So if you're going to get in the garlic business, don't uh, buy your garlic from the store and bring it home and plant it. You need to get the hard neck varieties. Um, we have the clove and the bulb, and uh, the best way to talk about that is on our next screen, or one more screen. So hard neck varieties, the most commonly one grown in, in Illinois, and uh, like I said, they're very cold tolerant. We have uh, on this diagram the scape, uh, and that's a marketable product. We'll talk about it in a little bit and how and when you market that. And then uh, leaves and then the bulb at the bottom. And uh, very cold tolerant of the hard neck variety, so that's, that's why we utilize those. <clears throat> Back to the terminology a little bit. So we have the individual parts, usually five or six on a, on a, on a head or a bulb. You have the cloves. The cloves are what we actually end up planting, uh, planting uh, when we plant the, uh, the garlic in the field. And then on the right-hand side, you see a picture of the scape as it's, uh, it's getting pretty mature, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go along. But that's some of the terminology so we can keep that straight. So here uh, in this picture, we've got a picture of the hardneck variety. And uh, so this was a, a clove that was planted uh, probably the last week of October. And uh, this photo is in late June. And as you can see on this photo, it's a hard neck variety. It's standing straight and erect. And uh, the bottom, the lower leaves are starting to uh, mature. Um, the leaves, as they start to dry and, and drop off, are an indication of how close you're getting to harvest. And as you can see in this photo, it was late June, so that plant is, is getting ready to be done. Now, you'll also note on this uh, picture, the, there's a little the scape on the top of it. It looks like it's curled over, and you can see there's no, what I'm going to call a seed head. It's not, actually not a seed. Um, you can see that scape has been cut. The uh, uh, seed head has been cut off, and the reason we do that is you don't want you want the energy from the plant going into the bulb itself, so you have a nice large size marketable bulb instead of going into form seed heads. And you'll find that um, if you don't cut that uh, the scape off in that seed head, that you have a significantly smaller uh, uh, bulb that you're going to market there. But that's the if you're striving to uh, grow good garlic, you know, in Illinois, that's a picture of a really healthy, productive plant right there. Okay, just a little bit more information about this, um, the seed head, which is actually called a, a bulbill, and you can plant them, and these are examples of planting that seed head. For instance, if someone might have forgot to cut one of the scapes and, and uh, it, it produced that uh, uh, bulbill, you can take those out and plant them, but you can see here already, uh, this photo was taken at the same time, everything planted the same. It's, it's a very, very small head, um, not really you know, marketable. If you're growing the garlic for uh, market, there's not many people who would probably want to buy that. So that was kind of an experiment there to show you uh, uh, what it's like. Now, if you just want it for your own use, it's they're nice to cook with. Uh, about one one of the the bulbs will be used whole, you know, instead of just one clove from a from a garlic uh, a, a regular size garlic. So there's a regular size garlic. That's kind of the goal of what we're getting to, and that's been cured and and uh, ready to just to be cleaned up a little bit. Um, and we'll uh, we'll talk about that, how much you uh, clean those up a little later. But that's kind of what we're striving for. Just a real quick slide on the on the bull bills. Um, you want to make sure that you you cut those scapes that I talked about. Um, you know, as soon as that starts to curl, and it'll curl around like a curly cue. Uh, if you just left it uh, growing, and then as it starts to form the seed head, it'll straighten up. But you want to go out there, and in Illinois, let's say you planted your garlic the end of October, the 1st of June probably is when you want to get out there, right, as those scapes start, start to turn and curl, and that's when you cut those off. And if you're, in, in, if you're selling, if you're a grower and you're selling, the scapes are really uh, attractive to sell. People look forward to those uh, uh, at farmers markets and, and your CSA customers because they're really nice to cook with and generally what people do is they chop those up for stir fries or you can grind those up in a food processor with olive oil and then freeze them in little uh, tablespoon size um, uh, uh, batches and then you can use those for cooking whenever you want. But 
Um, if you're growing it for market, you want to get those scapes cut off so you're not putting all that energy into the seed head and it's all going into the bulb. Here's just another quick picture that we took on uh, uh, some of that showing some of the things that we had here uh, about the planting that small bull bill. And this is a year later. Uh, and But if you kept planting those like that, it would take you a long time to get up the size of a marketable bulb like we would see on the, uh, on the right hand side. Okay. So here's another picture of that hard neck uh, variety doing well late June. Uh, you can see at the top of the picture um, there's the uh, they've got the seed head or the bull bill uh, cut off and uh, once again that's kind of a picture of, of what you're striving for uh, if you're growing garlic here in Illinois. Another close up of that uh, uh, bull bill forming and uh, the reason I have so many pictures of those in here is I want to make sure that everybody remembers it's just an essential part of growing garlic to get those cut off you know so we're putting the energy in the bulb and have a really nice marketable product. And this is actually a pretty mature one because you can see the seed head uh, is mature and the scape is starting to uh, straighten out. Okay. So uh, some of the unique requirements of, of garlic versus some of the other crops that you might grow. Uh, garlic uh, obviously has an internal chill, chill requirement. So uh, what that basically means in order for that one clove that you plant in the, in the, uh, in the field uh, in October, it needs to go through some physiological, chemical, hormonal changes uh, that are brought uh, forth uh, through going through a chill requirement and a certain uh, temperature uh, in the ground. Um, and uh, I'm just going to catch up on one, one question. How far down do you cut the scape? Basically, that's not a real uh, big rule of thumb. Just make sure you get that curl cut off. So where the curl ends, you can cut it off there. Thank you, Stacy. So on the chill requirement, um, now I get asked a lot of times, well, can it go through a chill requirement if it's not in the ground and you use a freezer or something like that? And that's a hard question to answer. Um, but I basically answer it, there's, there's a hormonal change, remember, that I talked about. And that really needs to take place in the ground after it's established its root system and, and, and has been doing the things that it's supposed to do prior to, the, to a hard freeze in the ground. So, uh, if you're going to be serious about growing garlic, you know, get it in the ground at the right time and let it go through the chill requirement there. So the chill requirement is going to take that individual clove and it's going to let it um, um, multiply into those five or six cloves that you're going to get in one big head of garlic. Um, so it's very, very important. Okay. So let's move on a little bit to, to the planning. Uh, we want to get that in in the fall. I'll talk a little bit about some dates in a minute, but we want to get good root growth, uh, in, and, uh, but we don't want a lot of top growth. So typically in Illinois, we'd be looking at um, late September through, well, it's hard to say. I, I try to have all of our garlic planted at the research farm the last week of October. Now, there are people that get by going later, uh, but what happens is we don't know what the weather is going to be doing in you know late November, December, uh, and you might not get enough time to get that root, uh, root mass developed. And that's what you're trying to achieve before there's a hard freeze out there. You want a good, solid uh, root mass that's going to help that plant really survive and, and produce a big bulb later on. Um, I think the next slide I'm going to talk a little more about that. Um, and then you don't use seed. You know, I, I, can't, I, I use the term seed head every now and then. We talked about that earlier, but you're using the individual cloves. Um, I do want to make a note that I have seen before is um, if you're going to save garlic uh, to plant, uh, which is commonly done, you know, you save your biggest, healthiest bulbs for planting because the bigger the bulb, the bigger the clove that you use, the bigger bulb you'll have on the flip side. Um, but one thing about that, if you're going to do that, make sure it's cured properly and that um, you aren't separating those cloves from the bulb until right when you're in the field they're ready to plant because they'll dry out and you can get some disease issues and what have you. So just bring your whole big box of bulbs out there and, and uh, um, get your kids, your family, your uh, interns, whoever you have to help separate those right before you plant. 
So the timing for fall planning uh, is, is very important. Um, there's going to be a range here, but um, I wouldn't go any earlier than late, late September. And, and I'm talking towards the end of the last week of September uh, in Illinois. Uh, all the way through the end of October is going to be um, ideal. If you went earlier in September, you know, you get way too much that top growth. And that's not what we want because that top growth will winter kill and cause a lot of issues. But on the flip side, if you go mid-December, you're not going to get any root growth at all, and probably that, that, that uh, clove is going to sit there and rot, and you're not going to have anything at the end of the year. So you can see there on the bottom, you know, you want about six to eight weeks of growth before the ground freezes. So that's not necessarily the first frost, because the ground freezing will be later than that. Um, but uh, six to eight weeks uh, is kind of an idea. And I think in the next slide here, yeah, I've got a picture here. Just to give you an idea uh, across the state of when we have that first, you know, 32 degree ambient temperature freeze, and and that's that's not you know one to one correlated with we can say two weeks after that we have a hard freeze. I just wanted to show you this so you have an idea of when those temperatures you know begin to really start to change. <laughs> All right, so soil requirements, um, garlic. Um, is uh, is really does really well in high organic matter soils. Um, so if you're one that's going to grow uh, in in a in a lighter organic matter soil, you want to make sure you amend that with compost and, and and what have you. And if you're if you're growing in a in a low organic matter soil or a sandy soil, you've probably been doing that all along. If you're growing anything, so high organic matter uh, gar garlic really likes it. Uh, a key to it is the good drainage uh, because it's a it's a root crop, a, a bulb crop. Um, it doesn't like wet conditions. You'll get a lot of rot. Um, you'll get rot over the winter uh, time period. So drainage is very very important. So um, it's pretty straightforward. You know, for most plantings, one to two pounds of 10, 10, 10, uh, 100 square feet. But check, do your soil test to check. You know, you may not need anything at all, uh, but you need to have some soil tests for that. It's not a huge, um, uh, doesn't have huge requirements for fertility, but obviously we need to have what it's going to take out uh, in the soil. Planting. Okay, so from here on out as we talk, I'm going to give you general uh, ways things are done because if we interviewed five uh, growers I work with that plant garlic, we would have six different ways that they do things. So. Uh, I'm just going to cover a number of things. General, uh, you can really modify these based on how you want to grow, uh, and and you'll be successful. So, you know, planting uh, a dibble planter, water wheel, uh, hand planting, and a single shank ripper are the majority of the ways you know that these are, these are planted. And uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about row spacing in a little a bit too, but it's it's pretty variable. The picture on the left does show that's way too close. Um, you know, that's about four inches, and, and we're talking should probably be closer to a foot. Uh, so that's that's way too tight to have those planted. But whatever approach you use, as I note in this screen here, make sure it's just about three or four inches deep. Uh, deeper is not better with these. Uh, you can cause a lot of issues and heartache for yourself if you go too deep. So stick to that three to four inches. So um, a small plot, um, I said 14, you know, 15 to 18, it's going to vary a little bit uh, between rows. Um, and what you'll do is you'll separate those individual cloves from the main bulb that I talked about. And uh, um, we generally, as, as a rule across the board, no matter how we're planting them, we go six inches uh, with the varieties that, that we use in, in research at Monmouth and, and with cooperators. And that seems to work really well. Um, and, and just another note to remind everybody, make sure you're not separating those cloves from the bulb uh, until right out there in the field to keep them as fresh as you can. And then the trend with growers that I work with is uh, a lot of them are going to 30 inch, 38 inch rows, uh, between rows, and then 6 inch spacing within the row. And the reason for that is they can use some of their mechanized equipment that's already set up for that row spacing. If they need to do, you know, various activities, they can do it mechanically for weed control or whatever it might be. Uh, uh, but that's that's certainly the trend with the commercial growers, uh, with a lot of the commercial growers I work with. I mentioned this a little earlier. As a general rule, um, 
larger the clove, the larger the bulb will be at harvest. So when you harvest these uh, these bulbs every year, you know, pull off the, the top 10, 20 percent, uh, the largest size bulb, because those are the ones that you're going to want to keep uh, for seed stock for next year. And um, uh, so that's what we're using. So we get out there to plant. You want to make just straightforward things. You all know this. Uh, make sure that you're planted with the, the tip up uh, and three to four inches below the soil surface. Uh, if you don't place these correctly in a seed bed, you end up with with misshapen stalks and just really product, a product that's unmarketable. Uh, and that really becomes a consideration with planting systems where you don't have any control of the clove all the way until it's embedded in the furrow. So you might go on YouTube and see some of these videos of people planting uh, and they're just, you know, holding 20, 30 cloves in their hand and they go along with a planter or a water wheel or something like that and, and they just drop it in. Um, if, if a commercial grower was going to do that, they would have to plant, you know, a significantly uh, increased number of cloves uh, because a lot of those aren't just going to, they're, they're going to be upside down in the seed bed, they're not going to be placed well, and, and they're not going to grow. Uh, weed control. Garlic doesn't do well with weeds, and uh, that's one of the reasons uh, that we like to have uh, mulch on that. I'm going to mention uh, a little bit more about mulch in a little bit, but it doesn't do well with weeds at all. So um, we can mulch it with straw or other organic material after planting. Um, uh, on planting three to four inches, that's from the uh, base of the clove. On planting that, when you put it in the uh, in the row. Thank you, Patrick. So. Um, um, so you want to make sure you mulch that. I'm going to talk to you about some experiments, some trials that we're doing at the research farm and around the state that I think really have promise. Um, the other way that people do it are, are with uh, commercial people. They use large round bales of straw. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but uh, let's talk real quickly about this interseeding into uh, a cover crop. And this is what we're doing uh, in research trials across the state. And so we're using oats as a cover crop. And what we do is we plant the uh, oats by August 15th. Um, well, one more slide here. Let's talk a little about the mulch, and I'll tell you about the trials. Removing mulch. I have questions, a question mark there because, once again, if you ask 10 people, you get 11 answers on this if you remove the mulch in the spring. And uh, my professional opinion and, uh, and, and as a grower is, yeah, you need to remove that mulch uh, once the plant starts growing in the spring. Uh, it can be on pretty heavy, you know, all through the winter uh, to keep it from uh, winter kill and, and a number of things. But you need to get the mulch off of the plant so it can, um, you know, get air. If you don't, if you don't get the mulch off of that, what happens is you end up uh, your stalk starts to decay and it gets various uh, pathogens and diseases and it just really hurts production. But the nice thing about removing mulch off of the rows is you just move that mulch over in between the rows and that's what's going to be your uh, weed control for the year, and then that will help hold moisture in, and it does a number of things. So uh, this is a note for the Illinois people uh, listening. I uh, can't speak about other states, but basically in Illinois, I-72 and south, you may not need mulch for frost protection, okay, like we would in, in northern Illinois. Um, the plots uh, that uh, Dr. Voigt uh, works on in Champaign uh, don't use any mulch at all, and they don't have uh, serious winter kill uh, at all. So if you're Cham Champagne South, uh, you probably wouldn't need mulch for, for uh, frost protection. But as I note on the bottom of this slide, any site's going to really benefit from mulch regarding weed control and, and how it uses water. And then the, the large round bale on the right, uh, bottom right of the picture here just shows um, a lot of the commercial people set up their rows on spaces where there's two rows the same width as the bale, and they cut the bale and they roll the bale down the entire width of the row, and that's what they use for spacing. It's just kind of an easy way to do it. Not sure many, if you're, any of you are backyard people, you'll be doing that. So here's part of our trial I was talking about, and what we're doing is instead of uh, uh, we're growing a living, <coughs> excuse me, a living cover crop that will winter kill, uh, instead of using uh, a straw, a purchased straw mulch. So we use oats because uh, they do create a lot of uh, biomass and above ground growth. 
and um, they will winter kill. So we don't need to come in there with any sort of a chemical to kill them later on. So uh, this is a picture of my uh, or of our trial at, at Monmouth, and it's kind of hard to tell by this picture, but the yellow flag and the green flag are both um, different rates of oats that we have seeded. And then this is a single shank ripper that we use uh, in the trials that we do that works very, very well. And basically, we go down through these rows. I'll have a picture of it in a minute. And we, we, we rip the row to a certain depth. We were just getting started on the row here. You wouldn't nearly go that deep. But we rip a single row down through there with that ripper. And it really doesn't, doesn't uh, do anything to the cover on the top. And then it makes a nice seed bed for us to plant into. So um, the way this progresses in this picture here on the left hand side, that's straw. So that's one of our controls that we have in there, just like uh, you know people have grown straw for many, many years. And then the middle in the middle here, uh, it shows the um, the the oats, and uh, I don't know if it's the high rate or the low rate, but basically this is the morning of the first frost that we had. And I don't have it in front of me when the first frost was that we took this picture. And then on the right-hand side was the uh, another, uh, we didn't do anything to that. There was no mulch, no oats, no anything. And, and that's kind of an, also a control. So the straw is a treatment, the oats are a treatment, and the, the uh, bare dirt with nothing done at all is our, is our control. So here's a close-up more of the depth that we planted with that ripper. So on the bottom of those rippers um, is kind of a, um, it's a widen, uh, it's a widened piece of metal on the bottom that kind of opens up a little furrow. So we basically go three or four inches down with that and we follow right behind it. The, the, the ripper goes through and, and uh, we follow it with a bucket and you're at the research farm, the way we do it is we just get down on our hands and knees and start going every six inches and, and planting. But it was very efficient and uh, we were just thrilled with how it worked for, for planting. And you can get these single shank rippers like this um, pretty reasonable and it doesn't take a real big tractor at all to uh, pull them. So here's a picture of the plots that we had and you can see down the middle there's, there's uh, five different rows. Those are the rows that we planted in through across the treatments. And uh, this picture is in the spring after, you know, you see the yard there starting to green up a little bit, but our oats have been winter killed, and that's kind of what the cover looks like. So once again, what we're trying to do, and, and if you're, you know, large scale or small scale, this would be super easy for you to do. We were growing that our own mulch, you know, that we basically kind of no-tilled into, and then that provided our winter frost protection, and, and then what we're looking at long term is here, um, how does that affect weed control? And that's where we, we really don't have an idea to say it, it's working yet or not. One of the things we're going to change this year is we're going to change seeding rate of the oats again and, and see how that works. But that's some exciting work that's coming out of the research farm. That's a picture of the rows looking down through the, the row, the five rows at the research plot. And here's a picture of a commercial producer that basically did the same, same thing, 30 inch rows into standing oak cover crop and, and you can see a close up on the bottom right of, of how that looks. Here's another close up of uh, um, uh, one of the plots. This was the 2x rate and uh, one thing that you'll note, and this is getting to be a problem all across Illinois and the Midwest are winter annual weeds. Uh, this was early in the season, you know, the yard you can tell is just barely starting to green up and we've got some pretty significant winter annuals. And at least that plot uh, at Monmouth, uh, that, was, that was our major weed competitor for the year was the winter annuals. So another thing we're going to watch very closely is, is what rate do you have to have that it controls those winter annuals, you know, that are, that are setting seed, uh, you know, early in the spring and, and putting on root reserves in the fall and really causing us some problems in the, in the commercial side of things. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of the home growers probably deal with these, these weeds too. <coughs> okay, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, watering, you basically don't need to do it. Um, I even, uh, you know, was working with growers, you know, last year that, that uh, didn't water their garlic at all and, and had really good garlic. It was it was kind of a interesting uh, hard job to harvest everything, 
because of the drought and how hard everything was. But you don't want to don't want to water the garlic. Just let it get you know whatever water is going to come from Mother Nature, because garlic uh, and water uh, it needs water. Um, but you can really get into some problems with rotting and and some other disease issues if you if you water that. Oh, and there's another, you know, you want to be very careful too. Sometimes people will water a little bit before they harvest to loosen the soil. And I'd really kind of recommend against that because you're going to end up harvesting a wet bulb. And that's one thing that you don't want because that will make curing uh, really hard to do. As far as pests goes, garlic uh, um, basically will have the same pests as like onions. Uh, but we don't see a lot of problems uh, with, with pests in uh, garlic. And uh, the key to that is just make sure you rotate it. You don't want to have one of your plots uh, in the field where you grow onions one year, you know, garlic the next. Um, you want to stay out of that allium family of crops uh, to keep these pests under control. But um, most growers will tell you there's very little, that's the one of the beautiful things about garlic, there's not a lot of pest issues that you have to have to deal with. <clears throat> okay, some general uh, management things here we can talk about. Just make sure that uh, on those scapes, once again, uh, they're forming in late spring. Make sure you get those cut off. Uh, if you don't, you'll reduce your bulb size by at least 20%. And we've seen an average of about 30% at the research farm with the work that we've done. And uh, you need to sell those products. You know, you can harvest those the morning of to your CSA people or the morning of the farmer's market. And people uh, will really look forward to when those scapes are going to come on because they, they've they been waiting all year for, so for some fresh garlic uh, to come on. And then they know uh, a couple months later we're going to have, uh, or a couple weeks later we're going to have uh, garlic out of the field. So they're looking for that. Okay. So as soon as they start to curl is when you need to cut them. That's a good picture uh, right there. Okay, I got to take a drink here real quick. Give me everybody okay you're hearing me okay and you see the uh, broad fork picture on on the screen someone get that in the chat just let me know you're okay okay all right so we're going to move to uh, harvest and um, I have worked with growers that have this system if you're not familiar with the broad fork uh, a broad fork is basically a really heavy handled uh, broad wide heavy pitchfork and the idea behind it is you can sock that in the ground and you can put your weight into it and you, you pop up the uh, bulb crops, potatoes, whatever you have with that. They work really well on a smaller scale. Um, I'm, I don't think uh, my back can handle uh, uh, using a broad fork on all that garlic there, but um, it is a, is it, they're really useful products and, and probably a lot of the commercial growers on here uh, use it already. But I'll tell you what, the system that we're using, I have another picture of that ripper on there, and we just did this a couple weeks ago. We decided on advice from one of the growers that I work with um, to, uh, what we did was, since we were on 40 inch rows, we took that same ripper, and what we did was we got as close to the row as we could without damaging the bulb, and we ended up ripping down one side, and then we tried the next row, we ripped down both sides, and just, it worked phenomenally. Um, it actually, uh, the bulbs, you just, you know, barely grab them to pop them out um, and they came right out. Uh, now a note on harvesting, don't ever try to harvest the garlic by just grabbing hold of the stalk and, and yanking out because the only thing you're going to pull out is, is the stalk and you're going to leave the bulb in there. Uh, garlic's, you know, it, it's not hard to harvest, but it's a sturdy plant. You want to make sure that you loosen that soil up somehow. But this has worked really well for us at the farm. Um, other ways commercially that people are um, harvesting, you can see some pictures here of, of basically, these are basically potato diggers uh, are what these are. The one on the right is kind of a neat uh, system. It's got a little cutting blade that you set right underneath the bulbs, the depth of the bulb, and then it's on an angle. And as the bulbs come up through that, basically on those tines, it, it, it pulls the bulb up and and, and gently bumps a little bit of the dirt off of it, and that's how you harvest them. Um, but some other things about harvest. Um, 
this is kind of a pet peeve of mine, and, and, and you'll understand why. Bulbs uh, bruise very easily, so I hate to see anyone throw a bulb at me unless they're upset with me, and that happens from time to time. But um, they can bulb ver or, uh, bruise very easily, so be really careful with them. When do you harvest? I have a note there that you know you harvest before the tops completely die down uh, because the plant is mature before those those tops are completely dried up and 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 fall over and you want to make sure you get them out of the soil at the right time so you don't uh, subject them to any sort of disease issues or what have you but as a rule of thumb, if you just looked at a stem and said, you know, when should I be harvesting? It's when about four to six green leaves are still attached to the top of it. We had some slides earlier you saw where the, the late June slides where the bottom leaves were, were dead and dying and the top were still green. That's a really good way. And then, you know, this the same old way of, you know, go out there and, and harvest some of them to see what stage they are. Um, because you, you can harvest and eat garlic, you know, earlier as, as green garlic. Um, so just whatever you pull out, just use there at home and cook up. So what do you do when you harvest? Well, you want to remove excess soil. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because you, you set yourself, when you cure these, these bulbs, you can kind of set yourself up for success or failure with some simple things that you do or don't do. Don't ever wash it. Um, what you want to end up having done is you want all of that soil and everything on the outside skin of that bulb to basically dry and come off, and I'll have a picture here in a minute. Uh, a key thing, though, is like with any of the produce that we work with, you know, in a commercial setting, you don't want to expose that to direct sunlight, you know, for any time period because it's going to heat up and cause some issues. So uh, the picture on the bottom left, hopefully they're coming right back in there, picking that up and getting it to the shed uh, for curing. And let's talk a little bit about curing. I'll have a picture on the next slide, but basically what you want to do is lay the whole plant on a screen uh, or hang it in small batches to dry. If you're going to hang it, um, make sure it's a very small batch because you want as much air as you can possibly get going through that, the, those bulbs. And um, uh, another thing about that is that um, you want to cure that with the stalk on. You don't want to harvest it and bring it to the shed and cut the stalk off. And one of the reasons for that is that stalk kind of acts like a wick and helps dry out, you know, uh, helps not necessarily dry out, but, but help cure that bulb. So leave the stalks on until for about 14 days. Uh, you want to make sure that, you know, it's in a well-ventilated room or area where they're getting a lot of airflow through there because you're trying to pull out moisture. Uh, so air will help dissipate that, keep the sunlight off of it. And then uh, constantly go in there, you know, and check for the rotting bulbs and make sure you get any of those out. And if you do see rotting in there, you're not getting enough airflow in between. So they may need spread out. You may need to put them, a lot of growers I work with just use simple pallets. Uh, they put pallets like on a hay rack. And so there's air underneath the garlic, there's air over top, and they keep the shed doors open. And after about 14 days, roughly, is is when you can remove that uh, the stock and you should be good uh, with getting that product to store for a long time. So here's a couple that um, basically, you know, they're probably two weeks into uh, curing and you can see the stock is dried up and uh, that outside, the reason I told you not to wash it is you can see on that outside skin there's some dried dirt on that and that's going to come off really easily uh, with your hand and, and uh, later on. You don't need water to do that. And I think I actually have another slide here in a minute to show you that. So complete curing will take anywhere from four to six weeks. It varies a lot on environmental conditions, you know, and, and, and how good the conditions are where you're harvesting that. This is a really neat setup on the bottom right hand side where they made basically rows like a wine uh, a wine glass holder and each one of those instead of wine glasses we have garlic in there and that's a really neat way to to uh, cure that I thought um, and then uh, so after you know it's completely cured um, you can get those cleaned up a little bit you know you can trim the tops earlier than four to six weeks but that outside dirty skin is what we're going to take off before we market it uh, a little about storage uh, basically you know you don't want the um, you don't want the garlic to sprout, you know, and it'll sprout most rapidly between 40 and 50 degrees, and uh, and you can see what the humidity is. Um, the the humidity for garlic is lower than most vegetables, 
um, because high humidity in, in a root crop uh, usually call, causes mold and decay. So the keys to storage and curing is, you know, uh, a cool, dry, well-ventilated area. Here's the one I was waiting to get for, uh, get to. So what we have here is, uh, you know, I have people ask me about cleaning uh, garlic. You're not necessarily cleaning it, you're just removing field dirt. And uh, so you have a picture before, you've got some of that uh, field dirt from the harvest, and you just, that product has been curing for, say, 14 days, and we cut the top off, off of the garlic, and then, you know, with a very simple, uh, you know, two, three seconds, we take that outer skin off. That's one of the ways you know that it's cured is that outer, that outside skin will come off very easily. It will start to peel away at the top, and if you just brush your hand across that, it's going to clean itself up. And on the right is the, the picture of the marketable product, and that's, that's a beautiful uh, bulb of garlic there that uh, consumers are really going to want to get a hold of. Okay, uh, variety. I uh, mentioned it earlier. Um, just as a, an aside here, the, the trials that we, the variety that we use in all of our trials here is called Music, and uh, Music is actually an heirloom variety, um, and the reason we use that is um, garlic has a lot of different flavor. You can get garlic that is extremely strong, you can get it that's very mild, and when you're a grower, you know, you're not growing for one individual person and their taste and preference, so what you try to do is hit the middle of the road, and what growers you know, tell, have told me over the years and their clients have told them that this music variety is one that just has really good garlic flavor. It's not overpowering, but it has good flavor, so it's a very popular one to grow. Uh, there's, there's others, uh, the University of Illinois Trials in Champagne, uh, Spanish Roja, Carpathian are another, uh, are other hard necks that do well. Uh, but I would venture to say this music variety is one that, that uh, will produce across Illinois. And you can see here, I just took some data that Dr. Voigt uh, in his uh, variety trials in, in Champaign, uh, the music variety actually, you know, can top the uh, production side of it too uh, over the years. So a um, lot of varieties out there, you know, you can play around with it, but you might want to just keep with the tried and true uh, in, in marketing these. So that's a, there's a picture of a nice nice bowl of uh, a homegrown, locally grown uh, garlic ready to be sold uh, uh, to the farmers markets or direct to, to restaurants or to CSA clients. And uh, uh, like I said, people really look forward to the garlic uh, coming on. They get excited to see it every year. Let's talk a little bit about um, marketing. Um, so as I mentioned when we started the very at, at the very start, um, garlic's becoming really popular um, for culinary reasons and medicinal. I won't talk at all about the medicinal side, don't want to get into that, but uh, uh, people are using fresh garlic uh, in a number of ways. As we start to see some of our food culture and, and habits um, uh, changing towards cooking with more fresh products, people are, are wanting to use uh, uh, garlic in their diets. Um, Stacy had a good question there. I'll catch up. Do you cut, cut the roots off after cleaning? Um, you can. You can trim them up. Most people don't cut them completely off. There's some sort of a uh, people just like to see those uh, for some reason makes them feel good that it's you know it's got roots that came from Mother Earth and makes you feel better. So you can. It doesn't matter. Um, um, as I said. Garlic's becoming one of those standard things like potatoes and tomatoes that almost everybody I work with is, is offering that. They know from year to year they may uh, try a different variety uh, of one of these products, but they know they're going to have the garlic and, and tomatoes and potatoes in their, in their marketing. And as, and, a, and, and as I mentioned earlier, that's really important too because with those types of products, those bulb and storage crops, uh, the same, same thing uh, with shallots. Shallots is becoming really popular, are becoming really popular. You can market those to your clientele throughout the year, so you keep in constant contact with them. You don't have that time frame where you, you know, you're not marketing anything to them, and uh, they like that product, uh, and, and you can keep in touch with your clients. So in terms of small farm marketing, you know, um, uh, it's, it's really a neat product to consider, consider growing out there. 
here's just a just kind of a random picture here of a, a couple of uh, um, I think must be the one on the right was a uh, one of them that planted from a, a bullville I I imagine not sure on that picture. So other other marketing things so. Um, New crop Chinese garlic, that's where most of our garlic comes from, hits the U.S. in mid-June. Um, and a lot of that product is what's going to hit the uh, grocery stores. And remember, they're selling soft neck. That's a different type of uh, 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 product than what you're going to be selling. You're going to be selling the hard neck. Uh, so one of the things you want to do is, is, you know, sell the differentiation of that product. It's locally grown. You know, if if you choose a variety like music, I'm not saying to use music. You can if you want, but you know, it's an heirloom. Sell that to them. Uh, tell them, you know, you're the grower. You can tell them how it was grown. Um, uh, I have a grower that does a really good job with garlic throughout the year, and she sends uh, pictures, updates uh, on the garlic uh, in her newsletters, and uh, uh, does that throughout the uh, growing season. Um, and uh, one thing that you don't want to do is, is compete. As a small farm local grower, you know, you're kind of niche marketing, so to speak. So you don't want to compete with the product that's coming from huge, you know, uh, international companies that go to, you know, every grocery store across the United States. You're selling locally to your local um, uh, store, grocery stores, restaurants, what ha have you. Sell that differentiation of that product, that this product is unique unique, it's high quality, you know, it was local, and uh, that's how you sell, that's how you sell garlic on local markets. So um, this is becoming very popular around the country a lot, and uh, like I said, California, um, Gilroy, uh, California there is the garlic capital of the world, uh, garlic festivals, it's, uh, um, I've talked to people that have been to some of these garlic festivals in California, and, San Francisco and what have you, and, and they say it's quite an experience. Um, uh, but I love the I love the quote on the bottom there. A nickel will get you on the subway, but garlic will get you a seat. So um, uh, I just love that one. I use that one with growers. So you know, is the next small farm garlic capital of the world uh, Illinois? Uh, might take a while, but we certainly have the growing conditions, you know, to do such. And uh, it's a product that we've shown, you know, across the state of Illinois that, that grows well. It's easy to manage. Um, uh, you can become a, a very proficient grower of garlic in, in a year or so by, by learning some of the tricks of the trade. And hopefully some of the things that we've talked about today, you know, will help you, help you get to that point. So what we're going to do now is um, if you have any questions at all, we've caught some of them as we went through the... Uh, session here today, but if anyone has any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box, and what we'll do is we'll kind of work through them one by one, and if I have to stay here for an hour, I'll do that answering questions, but uh, we'll have a question and answer session now with the chat box. Uh, if any of you have to leave, I know it's over the lunch hour, and you might still need to get a sandwich and get going. You're not going to offend me if I see you log off. Uh, like I said, you're getting an archived version of this uh, sent to you email. But I'll take any questions that you have in the chat box, and chances are a question that you have would be the same one that other people have. So um, if you need to leave, thanks for joining, uh, but certainly stay on and ask any questions that you want. And I'm going to take a real quick break here and take a drink of water, and you can type in your questions. Okay. Um, Leroy, a very poor stand, dry fall, uh, wet spring. You know, it, it, it's hard to tell. Um, if the wet spring, we had a wet spring here too in, in Western Illinois, and we didn't have, our stand was really good. Um, I, I wonder if maybe, you know, you didn't get uh, the root system uh, development like you needed early in the fall. Um, you might have got that planted, you know, in the right time frame um, that we were talking about, but uh, with, that, with the drought that we have, you might not have got the root system and might have caused issues later on. And, yeah, and I was talking with... Um, some of our um, uh, people on campus about some of the, the, the uh, virus issues uh, in, in garlic, and, and they, they said it, was, it would be very site-specific, that there's no big issues uh, uh, with any viruses in, in garlic, at least here. Uh, Greg, uh, can you successfully grow garlic in high tunnels? Yeah, um, you can grow it very well. Um, 
it doesn't prevent the uh, the chill requirement. Um, actually, I have one of my growers sitting here right next to me uh, has grown garlic in uh, his high tunnel. Uh, probably what you want to do is you're going to manage your, your high tunnel a little differently if you know you have something in there that require, has a chill requirement. Um, and one way to do that actually is to plant it on the outside rows of the high tunnel and then, uh, but don't expect too much. I mean, if you're going to try and keep, you know, some of these leafy greens like the spinach and, and bok choy and some of these things growing, you have two different environments uh, that's going to be a little bit of a struggle, but it can be grown very well in there. Just make sure you plant it on the outside edge so it's going to get as cold as it can get out there. Uh, Dr. Theory asks us, does garlic tolerate different kinds of soils? Uh, yeah, it does, um, but I come back to just make sure that it, you know, you're, you're amending the soil with organic matter. Uh, it does really well with organic matter. Uh, some of the considerations, I know James works in some areas uh, in Kankakee that are sandy soils. Uh, they can be a little more trying um, because of the water holding capacity of, of, of that soil. And if you are in a very sandy, you know, if, if all you have to grow is a sandy soil, you're probably going to have to consider some sort of, of a irrigation, drip irrigation system because the water holding capacity of that sand isn't going to do well for garlic. Now, I said it's not going to do well. You can manage it and grow good garlic. It's just going to be different than what I would grow in uh, western Illinois. A uh, list of uh, comparisons U of I test. Um, actually, what I'll do there, um, Dr. Franks, is I will send the link out. When you get the archive version of this, I'll send the link to the variety trials that we, uh, that we do in Illinois, and we'll take care of that for you. That's a good suggestion. Okay, Holly's got the greatest soil in the world, so she must be in Illinois, right? I know we have some Iowa people on there, but... Uh, um, Two-foot beds, four rows, four inches within a row. Um, that's really tight, Holly. I think uh, I think you're going to improve your quality uh, significantly if you go. Uh, you got to have a little more spacing in between the uh, in, in between the plants. Um, uh, I wouldn't go much under a six, you know, and that's still you're still going to get a lot of a lot of growth in there. I think you'll be glad that you did uh, give a little more plant spacing. Yeah, the general rule of thumb is, you know, within your row, six about six inches, your your row spacing, you know, you don't want to get much under a six inch there, but from from there on out, it's basically what's going to work in your system. So, for instance, the trials that I did, you know, if you remember in Monmouth, uh, we were on we were on 38 inch rows uh, because of our equipment size. So. Um, that was a trade-off, you know, if we do things a little different in research than you would a commercial setting, but um, there is a trade-off between, you know, how much uh, you want to you want to get a, a, a good density of product out there to grow, um, but there's a trade-off with, like, uh, commercial people that are using some of this mechanical stuff, the labor trade-off with less, uh, uh, less product out there is a good trade-off from them. When do you loosen the soil with a broad fork? What they were doing with that um, in the pictures that I had was that was right at harvest. They weren't loosening the soil for any other reason other than to get the, the product out, uh, the garlic out of the ground. So, um, you know, a broad fork would be great to use uh, before you planted, you know, to break it up a week or two before you, you uh, planted the garlic to get the soil broken up a little bit, but the picture I showed you was with them harvesting. Um, how many horsepower to pull that ripper? It was a that's a little tractor. I mean, the tractor we have it on is like a 30 horse. But remember, you're only going in, you know, four or five inches. Uh, if you're going to use it to fracture the subsoil, you go in quite a bit. And you need more horsepower. But we're only going in, you know, we probably set it at six inches to end up with a four inch uh, a trench to plant in. So it doesn't take much at all. Now you can also. It's different too with commercial growers versus a, a home grower. Um, you can go in there and just take, you know, a trowel or something that you would use. A transplant trowel would work best. And you can dig your hole with that, and you don't need to do anything to the soil. If I was in a garden center, garden setting, that's probably what I'd do is just use my transplant trowel and, and just make the holes with that. 
Okay, I'm right at 1 o'clock. I'll stay on here with questions if anybody has any, but I like to start on time and, and, and finish on time, so I, I don't uh, take any more of your time than I need to. Um, you've got my email there. Um, you can email me. Um, get to know, if you haven't uh, met your uh, extension educator in your community, uh, be sure and do that, and uh, they can help you out with things like this, uh, but I'd be glad to talk to anybody about the trials or any of the work we're doing uh, in, in garlic work or, or growing it commercially, and I hope everybody got some useful uh, tidbit of information with the uh, program today. If you're looking for some information from us uh, via email, and I hope to hear from you soon, and good luck putting your garlic, garlic in uh, uh, in October. So everybody keep in touch. Thank you.